Welcome back on Pangea, Professor Chosudolsky. We are all living in a very, very difficult period, historical period, full of dangers for Europe and humanity. And we're pleased to have you here because we just, we hope you will able to clarify the origin and the reasons of these events. Now, in 2011, you wrote an article about a meeting on Hiroshima Day, August 6, 2003, between executives of the nuclear industry and the military industrial complex to deliver the doctrine of smaller nuclear weapons development for use in theaters of war. Is there a risk that Western defense giants will push for far for the use of such weapons in a preemptive strike on Russia? First of all, I, I'm delighted to participate in this program. My greetings to everybody in Italy. Uh, indeed, we're dealing, we are at the crossroads of a major crisis in world history, not only uh, the possibility of a third world war, but also the, the collapse of economic and social structures worldwide and a threat to, the, to what we call the nation state. And we're led by corrupt governments. Now, with regard to that secret meeting, which was held at the offshoot uh, air base in Nebraska, at what was called Strategic Command Headquarters, the officials from the US government, together with the CEOs of the nuclear industry, and of course, the, the large defense contractors were there uh, for some form of dialogue and discussion. But what we are dealing with here is the fact that the producers of these weapons are also the decision makers in, in, the, in acts of war. In other words, uh, it, in a sense, it's the privatization of, of the nuclear doctrine and it's the privatization of decision making, which normally emanate from the Pentagon or from the State Department. So that is, the, that is one of the most important shifts is that we're dealing with the privatization of war. And specifically, we're dealing with the privatization of nuclear war. And I should mention that that meeting was held between the 6th and the 9th of August, uh, 2003. It was not an act of commemoration of those, uh, those who were killed the more than 140,000 people killed immediately by the, the attacks of the United States, Hiroshima, and then on the 9th, it was, it was Nagasaki. And that meeting was held from the 6th to the 9th. And they were there to commemorate their victories. And they never have denied the fact that the use of nuclear weapons in Japan was a, a crime against humanity. And we can read the, the documents from Truman's diary. But now the, the issue today is that the Biden administration is operating with a $1.3 trillion nuclear weapons budget. That's not the total budget of, of the United States. There are all sorts of budgets. Military spending is at the highest levels uh, in history, but 1.3 billion, I'm sorry, 1.3 trillion, 1.3 trillion um, dollars is slated to increase to 2 trillion in the year 2030. And consequently, all this money goes into the pockets of the, of the defense contractors, okay? So they have a vested interest in sustaining the nuclear agenda. And then there's another element is that they are now as private companies, they are there to promote and give a uh, sort of a, to give a different label. Uh, it's a public relations um, concept that nuclear weapons 
are no longer what they are were considered during the Cold War on the doc doctrine of mutually assured destruction, they are now considered as humanitarian bombs, mini nukes, humanitarian bombs. And, um, and they are promoting, and that followed the, the formulation during the Bush administration of, of what was called the preemptive nuclear doctrine, namely that nuclear weapons could be used as a means of self-defense uh, and to prevent war and to defend the homeland. Of course, that's a nonsensical uh, proposition. And then they are pushing the notion that these are not weapons of mass destruction. Um, they are saying we want to have more usable, more usable, low yield, low yield. I, I've checked the notion of low yield. It's something of the order of 3.3 times a Hiroshima bomb, okay? Uh, which resulted in 100,000 deaths within the first uh, minute or, or so. So that the, the bombs that they're putting forth as being more usable humanitarian bombs uh, are equally weapons of mass destruction, but the, the ideology and the concepts uh, which prevailed during the Cold War have been have been uh, eliminated. So what they're doing is they're promoting nuclear weapons as an instrument of peace, preemptive to safeguard the United States from attacks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I, if I can make an analogy, um, they have changed the label of the product, and it's a bit like for people who smoke in Italy. Uh, you, you, you can look at the, at the back of the pack of cigarettes, it says smoking is, uh, is dangerous to your health. Now, what they have done is that they've changed the la label of the bomb and they say this bomb is safe for civilians because the explosion is on the ground, okay? They, are, they actually then, all this goes into the military manuals, okay? Now, what I'm saying is, um, that the fact that they have actually redefined the bomb as a humanitarian instrument rather than a weapons of mass destruction changes the perceptions that the politicians will have because those politicians have the foggiest idea as to what uh, a nuclear war would, would entail. So that, that is, in a sense, the background. It, 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 it changes the, the ideology. And in the, in the 2002, uh, 2001 Nuclear Posture Review, which is a document of the Bush administration, they redefined um, these bombs as safe for civilians. And they also said they can be used in the conventional war theater and they don't require the permission of, of the president of the United States. Uh, I'm not saying that that wouldn't take place, but that is what, where we are. So that the US decision makers and the NATO de decision makers don't have an understanding um, as to the consequences of the use uh, of these bombs as a means of self-defense. It's incredible. It's terrifying, actually. But do you really, really think there is a risk of a third world war? Well, I, I think there is a, a risk of a third, a third world war for the simple reason that uh, it is being, uh, first of all, it's been debated uh, and, and uh, prominent politicians, including Hillary Clinton, said during her election campaign that she lost, of course, uh, she said nuclear war is on the table. And I can tell you that back in 1995, during the, the Bill Clinton administration, there was a plan to use uh, this type of tactical nuclear weapon, but there we are. But now uh, what I'm saying is that uh, they, do, they believe in their own propaganda. They don't understand that... Uh, any use of, of, of nuclear weapons, even with these small nuclear weapons, will inevitably spear us, spearhead uh, the world into a World War III scenario. And the use of nuclear weapons 
quest uh, will endanger the future of humanity. I have absolutely no doubt on that. Now, mind you, there are other, there are other areas of, of decision making where, where within a realm where mistakes are made, uh, where we have digital decision making, artificial intelligence, we have members of the US Congress or the European Parliament who have no idea as to what a nuclear weapon is all about. And the, the, the doctrine of the Cold War uh, uh, period has been scrapped, at least in the West. The Russians still understand what is mutually assured destruction. But in the West, they say a war is winnable. A nuclear war is winnable. And they have had many scenarios that where they actually simulate uh, uh, a nuclear war. And there's one which was recently published by the RAND Corporation, um, which involved a nuclear war against China. And it came up with a result that the United States would win that war. But the fact that there was a simulation which was made public, it was obviously made public so that the Chinese would read it. But there you are, they're simulating. Now, I, I should mention something else which most people don't know about. Uh, I mentioned Hiroshima on the 6th, uh, Nagasaki on the 9th. That was in August 1945. The World War II ended on the 2nd of September 1945. And on the 15th of September, about seven, uh, you know, 10, 10 days later, a bit more than 10 days later, uh, the US issues a document, an official document, which had already been in preparation to wage war on the Soviet Union at a time when the United States and the Soviet Union were allies and prior to the Cold War. This is a September 15th document to bomb 66 major urban areas of the Soviet Union with more than 200 bombs. I, we have it on record, okay? We have it on record. What, it, what this signifies is that the, uh, that the United States, it, its objective as part of a, an imperial project was essentially to wipe the Soviet Union off the map. Uh, I'm not passing a judgment on that. It was a, it was a scenario, but it was very explicit. It, there was the issues of procurement. They didn't actually ever um, actually implement that, but it's important from a historical perspective to understand that that happened before the Cold War and the Cold War would not have, hap have occurred had it not been for this the fact that they had already threatened the Soviet Union, I would say as early as 1942. And it was under the so-called Manhattan Project, which is a, was the project of developing nuclear weapons. And it was, they said it was against Nazi Germany. It wasn't against Nazi Germany, but that's another matter. But there we are uh, now today, uh, we have to look back in history and, uh, the, we have uh, the United States plus NATO with billions and billions of dollars invested in nuclear weapons and the possibility of mistakes is there. I know. Uh, and the possibility of decisions by incompetent politicians or corrupt politicians is there without understanding that uh, a nuclear war is the end of humanity. I categorically could say that, having I, studied it for the last 10 years. Do you think this is also a sort of a struggle uh, between a monopolar world and a multipolar world? Well, it, I think, again, if we go back in history, uh, we can look at the nature of U.S. imperialism, okay? Uh, and that imperialism is, is firmly set, not only in, in, the, in the several number of countries which were either invaded or attacked in the course of what we call the post-war era, 
okay, whether it, whether it was the, the war against North Korea, uh, the Vietnam, uh, Iraq, uh, uh, Libya, Syria, and many more, and many dictatorships in Latin America and so on. Uh, it is part of an imperial project. And the imperial project essentially consists in uh, in uh, destabilizing and uh, destabilizing competing powers. Now, uh, clearly, World War II led to the defeat of Nazi Germany, but it also led to the defeat of the British Empire, and it and it also led to the defeat of, of Italy as a, as a as a colonial imperial power, of and it and many other. I mean, it. There was a Belgian uh, colonial possessions, and then there was the Netherlands, which were in Indonesia. And if you look at the the geopolitics, how all this evolved is that the United States has become the dominant imperial power, and all the other powers have been. Uh, I mean, France as well. They've been sidetracked in in uh, in uh, in French uh, in, in uh, Francophone Africa, so that. Uh, the, if you look at it sequentially from, let's say, the end of the 19th century, where it was a confrontation between uh, the United States and Spain, well, the Spanish Empire is gone. Then it was, uh, then these successive wars have led essentially to the consolidation of the United States as an imperial power. And I should mention that uh, Nazi Germany could never under any circumstances have invaded the Soviet Union without petrol, namely, namely gasoline. Why? Because they didn't have any resources uh, to, I mean, for their trucks to go into the Soviet Union, they needed, they needed gasoline. The same. And where did the gasoline come from? It came from the Standard Oil, New Jersey, which was controlled by the Rockefellers. Now, the Rockefellers supplied oil to Nazi Germany up until 1945. And without that oil, it would never have been possible for, Ge for Germany to wage World War II. There, there's more to that because there, there, were, there were economic and financial interests which were backing both Nazi Germany, as well uh, as well as the uh, fascist government in Italy. This is well documented, but it should be understood. And I, I think that the objective of the United States was to ensure that Nazi Germany could destroy the Soviet Union, which they didn't. And in the wake of World War II, uh, 26 million people were killed in the Soviet Union. Uh, millions were killed in Germany as well. And ultimately, uh, the next step for them was to ensure global domination, um, which consisted in, in, um, in extending its power into, um, uh, across Eurasia. Many European countries ultimately became de facto, we, we don't, de facto satellites of, of, of the United States. So that, that's the background. And, and, uh, and I, I think that we are now in a situation this is economic warfare. It's not strictly um, what's ongoing now in Ukraine is part of a process of economic warfare. And it's, it's directed not necessarily solely against Russia. It's also directed against the European Union. Because yeah, it's that's for sure. Chaos. Unfortunately, the time runs very fast. And I would like to ask you a couple of things more. Is there a connection between the Great Reset and the war in Ukraine? Well, I, I, I would say that they are, the, they are the same actors behind this process. In other words, the major financial uh, institutions, uh, the, the military industrial complex, the intelligence apparatus, uh, the, the big pharma, the pharmaceutical companies, they are, they are both behind uh, the, the, I would say, the corona crisis without getting into details, and they're also behind the, the military agenda in Ukraine. Now, I should mention, it, it's very important that we understand that, that the lockdown policies, which were implemented in March of 2020, 
in 193 countries of the United Nations, with only a few countries actually abstaining, or uh, that lockdown, um, which implies the confinement of the labor force, is, is an act to close down national economies worldwide. Not entirely, of course, within it, but ultimately, if you, if you confine the labor force, your economy collapses. And then there were measures uh, which were directed to, uh, to, to uh, triggering crisis in air travel. Uh, there were a whole series of measures from air travel uh, to confinement of the labor force, to dis destabilization and so on and so forth, and ultimately cr uh, creating a, a destruction of, of the economic and social landscape worldwide, pushing com companies into bankruptcy, creating unemployment and in some cases famine. That is, I, I, I have worked and done research on this for the last more than two years. And I can say, first of all, that the, that the, the pandemic is a big lie. Uh, it was a pretext uh, to wage uh, an econo economic warfare. And it was, you know, you don't close down your economy if, if you have a public health crisis, quite the opposite. You have to keep your economy growing. But if we look at, at the background, if we look at the consequences of these actions, we can see very clearly uh, that um, uh, we're dealing with the most serious economic and social crisis in world history. I'm, and it's not comparable to anything previously, such as 1929 or 2008 and so on. Why? Because it's a decision-making process which instructs countries worldwide to close down their national economy, to save lives, allegedly save lives. And that was a big lie. Uh, we can't get into it, but it's, it's, a, it, it's there. And I would say, yes, we're living in a, in a process of destabilization, economic chaos, which is created quite deliberately, and which is then also leading to the destabilization of transport, commodity trade, uh, and, and, et cetera, et cetera. And the Great Reset is there, is presented as a solution to the damage committed by those who actually <laughs> are proposing the reset, okay? And, and, uh, and it, it essentially means taking hold of, the, of, of, um, of economic uh, assets, but not only that, you, uh, he uh, health institutions, universities, high schools, schools, they have destabilized the whole patterns of civil society worldwide based on a pretext, which was the pandemic. And, and, and that, is a, that is a lie, that is a lie. And uh, I think that what we need, of course, is to, to uh, tackle the issue of, of, um, of our governments, which are totally corrupt. Uh, they're controlled by, uh, by powerful financial institutions. I don't need to mention names. Uh, uh, Goldman, uh, Goldman Sachs in Italy plays an important role. Uh, the Rothschilds play an important role in France and so on and so forth. It's complex, but it is certainly not meant to, uh, to represent the interests of the broader electorate uh, in terms. The welfare state is gone now. The, the, I mentioned at the beginning of our discussion that nuclear war was privatized. But the state is privatized. The whole state apparatus is privatized. And that's what they want. And they, they have proxy governments, which they, they provide instructions to these governments. And that is the basis for their uh, establishment of some form of what they call global governance or global government. And, uh, and I recall the words of the late David Rockefeller, who said, uh, the world would be much more efficient if it were run by an alliance of bankers and intellectuals rather than elected governments. In substance, that's what he said. Uh, and um, of course, those intellectuals are the corrupt scientists and, and, and so on that are uh, behind this process. So that is where we are. And, and I think we have to understand um, 
that uh, there is uh, that th we're at a very dangerous crossroads. And it's not only Russia which is being threatened, as I said, indirectly the European Union and people in uh, people all over the world. And then, of course, in China. Now they uh, now the Chinese are being threatened uh, with uh, military uh, actions in the in the in the Taiwan Straits and the South China Sea, and uh, all of this ultimately uh, potentially leads to um, a process um, of economic and social chaos worldwide, and uh, indeed. The, the risks of, of, of a third world war are there. And nuclear weapons, is, of course, has to be understood and they have to be banned. And it's not simply a question, uh, you know, it, they have to be banned, uh, but, but there's, there's not only, a, <laughs> there's a whole gamut of weapon systems. There, there's the chemical weapons, biological weapons, there's environmental modification techniques, weather warfare, and all those weapon systems um, uh, could lead uh, uh, could lead our world into the unthinkable, um, which threatens where the the future of humanity is threatened in a very real way. Oh my God, it's not <laughs> a very happy future in front of us. <laughs> my God. Uh, what do you think is going to happen here in Europe if the Ukrainian crisis is prolonged in time? We're going to face, what, uh, a, a winter of economic energy and, and, uh, and food lack? Well, I, I think really what we have to push forward is the notion of peace negotiations in relation to Ukraine. And I should mention, at an earlier period in the month, late March, an agreement was reached. It, it was held in Istanbul under the auspices of, of the Turkish government, uh, which happens to be a member of NATO, a rather reluctant member of NATO. But nonetheless, that agreement uh, led to, it was a draft agreement, was subsequently sabotaged. Uh, I suspect it was sabotaged by, by, uh, by NATO as well as by the Zelensky um, proxy government. Uh, but I think it is very important that uh, peace negotiations should be, uh, should be implemented and major countries in the European Union should participate in that. Uh, it, it, it's not simply a question of, of an agreement between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, given the fact that in Ukraine, the situation is totally chaotic and where the government itself and the parliament are, are controlled. And then you have the neo-Nazi elements within that government. But I think it, it, it's important that, uh, that uh, within the, the European debate, there should be an option of peace, uh, of, of uh, establishing peace. And, uh, and, um, and this um, should be the object of discussion in, at the parliamentary level. Uh, I think in Germany, there's, there are certain elements of Oh, a certain openings because the, the chancellor is not entirely aligned with the United States. Um, and I, there's another element which, which I think is important, which, which we raised at, at, the, at the Florence uh, conference in April 2019, is the fact that there is a specific article in NATO, which is called Article 13, which allows any country to actually um, uh, exit from NATO, okay? There's certain procedures, that, but there, there we are. If a country wants to exit, exit from NATO, they have a way of doing it. Now, 
it's not, maybe it's not going to happen, but it should be on the it should be on the drawing board of of the European Parliament and on national parliaments throughout the European Union with Article ec, NATO exit under Article 13. I've reviewed that that article, and and it's something which is I think it. It, it, it's needed as an object of debate. And the, the thing is now, there are divisions within NATO. And that's why uh, the United States cannot necessarily, uh, it needs a certain consensus within NATO, and it doesn't have that, particularly with regard to Turkey. Um, but I should mention that we're in a situation which, if we look at history, uh, we have all sorts of alliances, which are very, very complex. We, in World War I, we had the Triple Alliance, the Triple Entente, we had shifts in, in allegiances. If any country has committed crimes against humanity, it's the United States. We have a whole history of, of, of criminality, of millions and millions of deaths. And, uh, and here we are in a situation where uh, we're not even allowed to drink vodka anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. I, I, I think, well, of course, in Italy, you have other drinks that you can have, like... Well, a, yes, a that's Italian true. Okay. Well, thank you, Professor Chosodowski. I'm afraid our time is out at the moment. So thank you so much for your presence. And thank you for all you said. Thank yes. you. <laughs>